So for those who just trickled in, welcome. Today's theme is cognitive neuroscience. We have a talk starting off with a talk with Dr. Tracy Riggins, followed by some amazing flash talks by Dr. Jacob, Jacob Belmond and Dr. Pierre-Yves Jonin. And next ses session in June, we'll be looking at uh, structural and functional connectivity. So we'll send out some more details uh, following this one. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the amazing talks here about cog, neuro and hippocampal subfields in relations to memory. Um, as always, please use the chat box. If you have any questions, I'll do a moderated Q&A. There'll be five minutes dedicated after each speaker's presentation and we can have some more interactive discourse then. But without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Raban. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker for today, who is Dr. Tracy Riggins. Uh, so Dr. Riggins is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland. Um, the goal of her research is to provide better understanding of the neural basis of cognitive development. Um, and the research conducted in a laboratory involves both typically developing children and children at risk for cognitive impairments and uses a combination of behavioral, electrophysiological and neuroimaging methodologies. And today she will be sharing her work, development of hippocampal subfields in early childhood, relations with memory and individual uh, differences. So, Tracy, you can start sharing your screen. Great. All right. And you can see my slides. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much It's uh, for the invitation. It's really, um, I'm delighted to be here and share with you my work looking at development of hippocampal subfields in early childhood and how they relate to memory and starting to explore potential sources of individual differences. So I figured for this group, I really didn't have to motivate why I was interested in hippocampal subfields, but I did think um, it would be an important thing to talk about why memory and why early childhood. So for me, the motivation for looking at memory uh, can be captured with this quote, you have to begin to to lose your memory, if only in bits and pieces, to realize that memory is what makes our lives. And I think the importance of memory is especially apparent when the ability is impaired or lost. We know how frustrating it is when we forget where we put our keys. And thankfully, most of us can only imagine how devastating you know, true amnesic disorders are. Um, in terms of why early childhood, uh, this is also related to memory for me, um, and it stems from two different phenomenon, um, uh, infantile and childhood amnesia. So what I'm showing you here is a plot um, of the average number of memories that adults can recall based on the age that they were at the time of the event. Now, I'll be the first to admit, it was a pretty long time ago that we were all five for you know, five years of age or younger. Um, but if I was to plot um, a forgetting function, what we see is that the average number of memories is actually fewer than expected. And this is thought to uh, be the result of two different phenomenon. The first is infantile amnesia or the basically lack of any memories uh, for the first two years of life. And then there's an associated phenomenon, childhood amnesia, which refers to this period between roughly three to seven years of age, where we have fewer memories than we should based on forgetting alone, but we, but we are able to hold on to several, you know, a few memories. And so this phenomenon, um, as, a, as I was trained as a developmental psychologist, has always been of interest to me. But as I said, these data are from adults. And so one of the first things that I was interested in is, the, is this same um, uh, childhood amnesia phenomenon true in children? And indeed, uh, work from uh, Carol Peterson and her group suggests that it is. So um, using a very similar paradigm, they actually tested young children um, and had them recall details when they were either you know, between four and 12 years of age of recent life events. And they observed how much of those events they could uh, recall after a two year period. And basically the, the um, results 
mirrored uh, that that was that uh, are found in adults. So this phenomenon is sort of as true for um, eight year olds as it is for 80 year olds. Now, one of the sources of uh, why this might be the case um, may be due to prolonged brain development. And when I started this work uh, back uh, no, a number of year, years ago, much of what we knew about hippocampal development came from studies um, in non-human primates. And so I'm showing some of that intricate circuitry here and uh, work by several groups um, has uh, delineated um, sort of this uh, schematic uh, representation of the hierarchical organization of those pathways through the different regions of um, the hippocampus. And distinct regions, layers, and cells of the hippocampus are thought to exhibit different profiles of both structural and molecular development during early postnatal life. And so that can be illustrated here um, with this uh, figure of the schematic of the circuitry in a juvenile, where you see a protracted period of development um, in the dentate gyrus and regions downstream, such as CA3. So you can see that uh, those regions are uh, depicted here in the adult, but they're sort of you know, missing from uh, this schematic for, for the juvenile. And that can be contrasted with other regions such as CA1, which is thought to mature a little bit earlier, um, receiving its direct projections from entorhinal cortex, or CA2, um, which is highly interconnected with subcortical structures. And um, so uh, the outline for my talk, uh, we, the goal of my work early on was to track uh, the development of these hippocampal subfields in human children, and then also look at their relations with memory. So I'll be talking about the same sample of children throughout my talk, um, and really highlighting four different analyses that we've done over the years. Um, so the first one is a cross-sectional study in children who were between the ages of four and eight years. The second analysis is a longitudinal follow-up. And then uh, we've just started to look at some uh, sources of, of individual differences. So I'll highlight two different analyses looking at um, potential impacts of stress and uh, sleep. And this work was all um, funded by the National Institute of Health. So to introduce you to our sample, um, we recruited 200 children between the ages of four and eight years of age. Half of them were female, and you can see some other demographic uh, characteristics here. And um, uh, the overall design for each study visit was that the children came to the lab and participated in our um, encoding portion of our memory task, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. And then after about a week delay, they returned and they did the retrieval portion of the memory task and participated in our uh, MRI procedures. So briefly, the memory task was borrowed from the literature. It's uh, the novel fact uh, source memory paradigm used in both adults and children. Uh, in brief, we uh, teach children novel facts, such as those seen here, from one of two sources via a video. So they either learned um, a fa facts from a, a puppet, or they learned some facts from a puppet, and then some facts uh, from a female experimenter. Then after a week delay in sort of the guise of a trivia game, we asked them to not only recall the facts, for example, what are the only big cats that can't roar, but also who did they learn that from or how did they know it? And our dependent measure of interest is uh, source memory or the ability to recall not only that fact, but that fact and its initial source. Just to show you some uh, findings from that behavioral uh, portion of our study, memory uh, performance does improve as a function of age. And there does appear to be some, uh, a little bit faster rate of change between about uh, five and seven years of age. And I point that out because it, this laboratory-based task um, mimics that real world um, data that I showed you on uh, one of my earlier slides for autobiographical memory. So that's sort of a nice sanity check for us um, that even in the lab, we can perhaps get at this phenomenon that's of interest. Now, in terms of uh, delineation of the hippocampal subfields, we used a pretty standard uh, T2 weighted sequence. You can see some of the parameters there. 
Uh, but what I'd really like to highlight is because of the age of the, the children, uh, they were quite young, um, we, uh, great lengths were taken to ensure we acquired high quality data. So for all of our children, we practice everything in a mock scanner. So this is what our mock scanning room uh, looks like. It's very child friendly and we practice everything um, and we teach them how to remain still uh, uh, for the duration of our scans but we are not above bribery. And so we've spent also a lot of time coming up with fun prizes uh, to motivate the children to complete our protocol. Um, so that ranges from t-shirts with a picture of their own brain on them, temporary stickers and tattoos with pictures of their brain, a 3D printing of their brain image and the color of their choice. And then for our littlest guys, hey, we'll even put a picture of their own brain on their teddy bears t-shirt. And so we found that these methods really motivate our young participants um, to stay still and uh, so we can acquire high quality data. Uh, now you may be more interested in um, our actual uh, delineation methods. And so uh, back when we started this work, um, we didn't have this uh, hippocampal subfields harmonization group and these efforts, which is just one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of, uh, of the work that's going on to harmonize uh, efforts. But we um, adapted a protocol that existed in the literature from uh, La Jouie and colleagues. And the reason we selected this one is because it, was, uh, it allowed us to at least start to look at subfields in both the head and the body of the hippocampus. Some of my previous work looking at hippocampal subregions, specifically the head, the body, and the tail, had suggested interesting age-related differences in the head of the hippocampus. And so that's why it was important for us to choose a method that would allow us to look not only in the body, which as many of you know, is a little bit easier to do, um, but also to begin to look at regions in the head. Now we had to sacrifice um, some specificity. And so in our protocol, um, we co it's collapsing over some of the smaller subfields such as CA2 and CA3, and those are grouped with the dentate gyrus. And so in this presentation, um, all these subfields will be grouped together. Um, I will refer to them as the combination region since it uh, has uh, uh, multiple subfields included and they will always be represented in blue. Um, CA1 is isolated uh, for the most part by itself. It will be represented in green. And then finally the subiculum uh, will be represented in red. And uh, we, did our best um, to become uh, reliable and uh, we created a study specific template um, from 20 of the cases of, of children in our study to from each age group. And then we used um, ashes uh, to extract um, the volumes from all the participants. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that uh, tracing protocol, but let me just jump right to our uh, findings in terms of age related differences in volumes. And so what I will show you here are volumes um, for the head and body for each of our um, subregions of interest and males and females are plotted uh, separately in different colors. So first in terms of the body of the hippocampus, we did not see uh, any age or uh, age related differences in any of the three uh, subfields. In terms of the head of the hippocampus, we actually saw um, main effects of sex in both subiculum and the combination regions, such that male volumes in males were greater than volumes in females. And that was even after correcting for overall differences in head size or intracranial volume, ICV. I should note at this point that all of the analyses I'll talk about today, we always do correct or control for variations in intracranial volume. Um, the one region that we did see age-related differences was in CA1 in the head of the hippocampus. And it appeared to be a quadratic function sets such that volumes in the middle age group of our sample were, appeared larger than either the younger or the oldest group. And so I'm gonna use this uh, sort of green um, line here to kind of represent uh, the, the findings of those age-related differences. Now, in terms of my second question, how did volumes, uh, or, or rather did volu these volumes relate to performance on our source memory task? And so uh, what we found was, um, here I have source memory performance, 
plotted as a function of volume of different subfields. And what we found was that volume of the combination region in the, in the body of the hippocampus was positively associated with uh, memory performance. Larger volumes were associated with better memory. In contrast, in, for CA1 volumes in the body, we saw an opposite pattern, such that smaller volumes were associated with superior memory performance. And then finally, in a third region, we found an, a dissociation with age. Um, for CA1 in the head of the hippocampus, we found that larger volumes were associated with better performance for younger children, but that smaller volumes were associated with better performance for older children. And at first blush, a uh, transition like this um, might be somewhat surprising, but I'm going to kind of bring back that schematic representation of the age-related differences in volume and remind you that kind of the maturational profile that was suggested from our cross-sectional data was sort of an increase in volume followed by a decrease in volume. And so if we consider um, kind of the maturational profile here, this pattern um, begins to make a little bit more sense. Um, however, um, in order to really address that question, and if there is a developmental transition, of course, longitudinal data are needed. So just to summarize, um, in this initial study, we did see that volume of the hippocampal subfields were related to uh, differences in memory, particularly during early childhood, but that this varied both with region and age. So in some regions, bigger was better. In other regions, smaller uh, was associated with superior memory performance. And in yet other regions, such as the uh, CA1 subfield in the head of the hippocampus, there was a dissociation with age that for younger children, larger volumes were um, associated with better performance, whereas in the older children, smaller volumes were associated with better, um, better performance. And as I mentioned, this suggests a very interesting developmental transition happening um, but around that period of time, but that to address that, we do require longitudinal data. That brings me to the second analysis that I wanted to tell you about today. Um, we followed 100 children in our sample for a period of three years using an accelerated longitudinal design. And so what I mean by that is that we took um, the four-year-olds um, and we followed them um, and did the memory assessment and MRI assessment each year for a period of three years. I'll refer to them as our four-year-old cohort. We did the same thing with the six-year-old cohort. And the reason this is called an accelerated longitudinal design is that in this way, we only had to wait three years, um, but we were able to track longitudinal changes, both in memory and in um, hippocampal subfield volumes across this period from four to eight years of age. So this is a little diagram of our resulting um, uh, study or sample where um, some children had two to three data points indicated by the dots and the, and the bars, whereas um, other uh, children in our sample just had the one data point. Um, but you can see how we're able to sort of um, track uh, across this whole period. Now to actually model this longitudinal change, I had to find an expert. Fortunately for me, uh, this was something that our, uh, our own uh, Dr. Kelsey Canada was interested in doing, and this was uh, part of her dissertation work. And so uh, what she did was she took those um, observed measures of hippocampal subfield volume in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and created a latent variable for each of the subfields. Um, here, I'm just showing you an example of this combination region and uh, use latent growth modeling to not only um, estimate uh, the initial starting point of the volume, but also track the growth of volume over time. So between four to five years of age and from five to six years of age. And then she also did this same, used a, the same modeling to track that growth in volume um, from six to seven and seven to eight. And then she was able to knit these together so we could um, model change across this entire period. <clears throat> And uh, what did she find? So here I'm showing you again results for the head and the body of the hippocampus separately um, for each of our uh, sub, sub fields of interest. And um, so for the head of the hippocampus, 
what she found was actually consistent uh, with our, uh, or somewhat consistent with the findings from the cross-sectional analysis, where for CA1 in the head of the hippocampus, um, she observed growth um, in uh, between four and five years of age. So in the younger children in our sample, there was a positive um, uh, increase in volume uh, between four and five years of age. However, contrary to what we observed in our cross-sectional analyses, she actually um, uh, was able to detect growth in the subfields in the body of the hippocampus. Specifically, she saw increases um, in the combination region um, that were significant between uh, five and six years of age and, a, and a marginally significant uh, between six and seven. And she also observed growth in the subiculum between five and six years of age. So of course, the second uh, question that was of interest was, does this growth and uh, change in these volumes relate to improvement in memory performance? And indeed, it, it did. Um, so here, uh, I'm showing you, uh, I, I, sw I switched the axes on you, I, sorry about that. Um, but uh, I'm showing you that increases in volume of the CA1 in the, in the head of the hippocampus were positively associated with improvements in source memory um, during that same period of time in, in a, in a in, and it was a positive association. So greater growth was associated with greater improvement in memory performance. And the same um, was true for the increases in uh, subiculum uh, in the body of the hippocampus. Um, greater growth in the subiculum was associated um, with uh, increases in memory performance. So to summarize, um, what she found um, was that growth of those hippocampal subfields was related to age-related improvements in memory uh, in early childhood. Uh, and that was specific to CA1 in the head and subiculum in the body. And findings in the CA1 head were consistent with the cross-sectional findings. However, you might have uh, noticed the discrepancies. And part, some of those discrepancies may have arisen from individual differences. Recall in the cross-sectional analyses, we're comparing different kids, um, you know, a different group of four-year-olds to a different group of five-year-olds to a different group of six-year-olds. Um, and it's really just with the longitudinal analyses that we're able to detect co-development between changes in the brain and changes in behavior. So um, because of these, we actually started to get interested in these individual differences, um, as opposed to considering them, you know, sort of noise. So what I'm going to do is bring back this initial figure that I showed you. And instead of trying to have you focus on the trends in terms of sex or age, I'll have you hone in on these individual data points, um, even just for one of the graphs. And you can see how the, the smattering of, uh, of dot, how um, variable uh, the, the measures are. So um, some of our work has looked at sources or potential sources of individual differences. Um, work, my work with uh, subregions of the hippocampus has shown differences in volume um, as a result of parent differences in um, parent experiences of parenting behavior. Um, we've also looked at things such as stress and stress hormones, such as cortisol, and also sleep. <clears throat> And in the remaining time that I have, I'll just tell you about um, our work on uh, stress and sleep. So again, to tackle uh, difficult questions such as what is the association between stress on, uh, uh, the hippo on hippocampal development, I had to recruit another expert. And um, this is uh, the newly minted Dr. Morgan Botdorf, um, who did this work, some of this work for her dissertation. Now in the literature, um, uh, there's, it's been documented that in, in rodents and adults, that experience of extreme stressors has a negative impact on subfields in the hippocampus. And so this is just sort of modeling some of that um, hypothesized pathway that um, it's thought that experience of a psychosocial stressor yield, leads to an increase in stress hormone levels, uh, for example, the human stress hormone, hormone cortisol, which can then lead to altered hippocampal structure and altered hippocampal function. Now, I told you um, in our sample, these were typically developing children. So um, what uh, Morgan did was not look at extreme stressors, such as experience of childhood maltreatment or um, severe uh, poverty, Instead, she asked the question, 
are more frequently experienced but less traumatic stressors associated with hippocampal uh, development. And so these examples of these uh, stressors are starting a new school or moving to a new home or perhaps experience um, divorce of one's parents. And so uh, more, what Morgan did um, was in addition for our uh, cohort of children, she not only had um, their uh, measures of their hippocampal subfields as I've described before, but she also asked parents to complete a stressful life events checklist at the initial um, visit for both the four-year-old and six-year-old children. And what this uh, questionnaire was, is it asked parents to report on 52 different life events that could have occurred in their child's life within the previous year. Parents rated whether the event occurred or did not occur and what effect it had on their children. Morgan used this to create a stressful life event score. Um, which took into account both the number of the events and also the severity of the events. Now, for the four and six-year-old cohort, this is what she found. As I said, these were typical developing children, so their stressful life event score were not very um, high, but there was some variability in the sample. And importantly, the average levels of, um, or av average stressful life event scores were similar between the four-year-old and six-year-old cohorts. You might be interested, what were some of the most frequently reported events? Um, and it was uh, things that I had mentioned before, such as changing um, schools or moving to a new place. Um, there was also uh, things, parents starting a new job or being separated from parents or parents experiencing high levels of stress themselves. Um, so using a very similar modeling approach uh, to what Kelsey used, um, Morgan uh, ran separate models for each of the hippocampal subfields and for each cohort. So she ran the four-year-olds and the six-year-olds separately. She also added a predictor, um, that initial uh, stressful life event score at either four or six years of age and collapsed across left and right hemisphere and also across head and body of the hippocampus um, because this was um, exploratory and she was attempting to minimize the number of comparisons she was making. And um, in that way, she was able to model the impact of that stressful life events, not only on initial volumes, but also explore whether that um, early or that experience of stressful life events impacted subsequent growth of the hippocampus. And she did this again for each cohort separately. And what did she find? Um, well, for CA1, she saw that in the older cohort, in the six-year-old cohort, greater stressful life event score was associated with smaller volumes um, at that initial time point. She found uh, a slightly a similar finding in the younger cohort Again, greater stressful life event score was associated um, with decreases, but here these decreases were in the change in volume um, from five to six years. And so this was an initial suggestion that not only um, was the stressful life events perhaps um, impacting uh, the, the inner slope or that initial volume, but also that the change, that growth um, that we think is happening. Uh, in terms of the combination region, she saw that six-year-olds, um, again, a greater stressful life event score was associated with smaller volumes at that initial time point. And then, um, but she did not observe that for the four-year-old cohort. And then finally, for the subiculum, she did not observe any associations for the stressful life events between the stressful life event score and uh, subiculum volume. So to briefly summarize, um, it this um, is, consistent with the hypothesis that experiencing um, more stressful life events uh, was associated with smaller hippocampal subfield volumes. These effects were uh, region dependent, um, seen primarily in CA1 and that combination region. But the direction of the effects were in line with studies um, on extreme stress in rodent um, and human samples in the literature. All right, and last but not least, I wanted to tell you briefly um, about the work that we have started doing on sleep. And this is done in con uh, collaboration with Dr. Rebecca Spencer at the University of uh, UMass Amherst. And 
um, sleep, uh, just to motivate this briefly, is known to be important for brain plasticity and memory consolidation. And early childhood is an important time in our lives in terms of sleep as we transition from biphasic to monophasic sleep. So um, this is the time period where preschoolers um, go from being habitual nappers to um, then transitioning to not needing the nap and um, again, having a more monophasic sleep pattern, just sleeping with that one sleep out overnight. Um, now I've already told you that my work has sort of linked development of the hippocampus to memory development. And what uh, Be Re Rebecca Spencer's lab ha has shown is that this transition from biphasic to monophasic sleep is also related to memory development. And so sort of what we wanted to do is put our, um, our uh, bodies of work together and address sort of this other side here and ask the question of how all these things fit together. And so in short, um, a hypothesis that we put out there um, and, and we've talked about, and others have sort of written about as well is um, perhaps the development of the hippocampus leads to an increased capacity to, uh, for memory. And that subsequent memory development leads to a reduced pressure to nap and ultimately results in this sleep transition. So fortunately, we had also asked parents, in addition to reporting on the stressful life events, to report on their child's children's sleep habits. We asked two different questions. We asked parents to report on the average 24-hour sleep duration in their children, and then also where they um, were in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that transition from biphasic to monophasic sleep. Were they a, a habitual napper or were they sort of going through the transition or were they on the other side and rarely napped anymore? And to cut right to the chase, we associated the, these measures with volumes of the hippocampal subfields. And what we found was for younger children, volume of that combination region in the head of the hippocampus was positively associated with that 24 hour sleep duration after controlling for a number of con potential confounds, such as age, um, uh, ICV, and, and sex. However, the same was not observed in um, the older children. And so that's plotted here. Uh, we were again interested in the transition from biphasic to monophasic sleep. So within this younger cohort, when children you know, where some children were still napping and other children weren't napping, um, we compared volumes of the subfields um, between nappers and non-nappers. And in the hippocampal body, we found that volume of the CA1 was significantly different between the, those who were habitual nappers and those who were no longer napping. And so that um, finding is consistent with that hypothesis uh, that I sort of described before, um, that that transition from biphasic to monophasic sleep might be related to hippocampal development. But I will return um, to uh, my call for more longitudinal data. The only way to really track this transition um, is, is to follow children longitudinally. And so indeed, that's what we're currently doing. Um, so this is just to show you um, sort of that uh, our approach we're enrolling children at various different ages who are habitual nappers shown here in red. And then we're following them over time and tracking not only their um, nap status, but also um, their development of their hippocampus and development of their memory so that we can start to tease apart um, age-related um, changes from these changes that are due um, to that nap transition. <clears throat> so um, that's work that's currently ongoing, um, and I'll have to tell you the findings at a later time. And then finally, I thought I could use this as an opportunity to connect with some um, researchers and if, uh, if anyone was um, doing work with younger individuals. And so also we've recently started looking at development of hippocampal subfields in even younger children, specifically infants and toddlers. And so this graph I had shown you um, how the, the schematic of the circuitry or the pathways in adults, I noted that we think the dentate gyrus and uh, CA3 might be you know, prolonged in their development. But I didn't show you sort of the work in infants where um, CA1 and CA2 are thought to be um, undergoing development. 
And I think this is a particularly interesting time where we really want to look, um, not only because we know that the hippocampal circuitry is changing, but also because it relates to that uh, other phenomenon, um, infantile amnesia, or that lack of memories from the first two years of our life. And so these are just some of our images about how we've tried to tackle this using an MRI safe crib, um, some of the methods we use uh, to track as this uh, little onesie says, hippocampal development in progress. So I'm excited to connect um, with others um, who might be doing work in even younger individuals. So with that, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the funding sources, my lab, um, without whom, as you saw, I would not be able to do any of this work, the participants and their families who spend a lot of time, and also thank you for um, your attention. And I'm happy to invite questions. Wonderful job. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's amazing to see how that all fits together, thinking back five, six years ago when it was just starting off the ground. Um, so with that, I would invite anyone who has a question for Dr. Riggins to use the chat box and then I can moderate from there. And I will reiterate, I, this is one of the reasons I really am fond of this group and um, am eager to participate in the harmonization effort so we can um, you know, ultimately combine data. And uh, I learned a lot from, from all of the presenters here. So thank you so much. All right, so we have a question from Cameron Ellis, who I was wondering if he would, he would pop out. He was interested about what protocol you intend to use for the infant subfield segmentation. He would love to share notes because as you know, he and Nick Turk Brown are, are working with the little, little ones. Exactly. Uh, Cameron, uh, perhaps we can set a time to meet afterwards. Um, we've recently just uh, acquired those data. And so we're just starting to consider our options. And so um, I know you, you know, probably have some expertise. And, and so I think um, I'll just answer your question or, you know, say we should talk. <laughs> I would love that. That'd be great. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, Jakob has a question for the first part of the talk. To what extent are findings specific to source memory? Would you expect different results with different behavioral paradigms? Uh, for example, looking at recognition memory or tasks requiring pattern separation? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so we did actually have a battery of um, memory tasks. And, and so we have, we've been able to look at that. And I will just again highlight uh, some of uh, Dr. Canada's work. Um, she looked specifically at a mnemonic similarity task um, in, in a cross-sectional sample um, and published those data a couple of years ago um, in cerebral cortex and, and found indeed that performance on the mnemonic similarity task um, thought to uh, require pattern separation was indeed related to volume of that combination region um, that included um, CA3 and the dentate gyrus. And so um, we, we, I don't necessarily think they're specific to source memory. So we have looked at at least um, and published that mnemonic similarity paper. So I would definitely um, have you look at that one. And then also, as I told you, I'm interested in autobiographical memory. So memory for real world life events. And um, we have uh, some data where we interviewed children about their life events. And so that's something that's ongoing. Um, so in short, I don't think it's specific you know, to that to that memory paradigm. And I think that's a really important thing to do is, is start to look at um, the tasks where there are associations and then tasks where there aren't associations and, and sort of tease that apart, so. Awesome, great. Well, I will thank you again, Tracy, for that phenomenal presentation. And I look forward to seeing uh, what's up in the coming in the pipeline. And I will swivel back to Ravan and uh, Jakob, you could probably start sharing your screen while he gives your intro. Yeah, so I'm happy to introduce our second speaker with uh, Dr. Jakob Belmont. Uh, so Dr. Belmont is a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, his research interests include special navigation and episodic memory and is most curious about 
our coding principles in the hippocampal and trinal region enable flexible cognition. Uh, in his research, he combines fMRI with uh, behavioral experiments and virtual reality technology. And today we'll be sharing his work, uh, the hippocampus constructs <coughs> sequence memories that generalize temporal relations across experiences. Uh, yes, thanks for the kind introduction, Robin, and uh, thanks, Kelsey and uh, Robin, for putting together this uh, great webinar and giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, so I want to talk about some new data from an fMRI project that I've been working on. And I hope to convince you that event memories in the hippocampus store actively constructed times of events and that they generalize temporal relations across different sequences. So the notion that memory is a constructive process probably goes back to Bartlett almost 100 years ago when he already pointed out that our memories are not veridical records of the past, but rather our constructions. And today I wanna to talk about constructive sequence memories. So in some circumstances, temporal memory can also be constructive. Consider for example, the question, when did your mom call yesterday? The precise time when your phone rang might not be part of your memory, but you do remember that you were watching a football game and you know that those start at nine. And you also recall that you went to bed at 11 and somewhere in between she called. So based on these information, you estimate that the call took place at around 10. So you use the temporal relations of the events from the episodic sequence that is your memory of last night, together with associative, semantic, or contextual information to construct when this event happened. So memory for time can also be constructive. Some of our own work um, shows that the temporal relations of events are reflected in multivoxel patterns in the hippocampal and terrinal region. So, for example, we ran an experiment where participants navigated a virtual town and encountered a sequence of events along a route, shown as a blue line through the city here. And the blue circles correspond to the positions of the events. And we scanned participants after they learned this event sequence. And what we saw was that the anterior hippocampus and the anterior lateral entorhinal cortex formed sequence memories that mapped the sequence structure so that temporal relations between events were reflected in multivoxel patterns. The similarity of activity patterns correlated negatively with the temporal distances between pairs of events. So to break down that correlation, events that were close together in the sequence, so have a low distance between them, um, were more similar than events that were far apart, so had a high distance between them. But is this due to, due to mnemonic construction, or is it the order of events or the true time that elapses that underlies this effect? So this is the first question that we want to address uh, with the project that I present today. Do sequence memories in the hippocampal and terrinal region reflect mnemonically constructed temporal relations, or do they more tightly relate to event order or elapsing time? But beyond the construction of specific memories, the hippocampus has also been implicated, implicated in combining information across episodes for inferential reasoning and generalization. So here we ask whether it also generalized temporal relations across sequences. So to illustrate this, consider a second sequence with different events. If our mental representations of these sequences share an underlying structure, which could be our day-to-day -day rhythms or the reference frame provided by the circadian clock, we could in principle organize them along the same mental timeline when we think about when these events happened. So the temporal relations of both sequences could essentially be represented along the same underlying dimension. However, where the sequence representations in the hippocampal and terrinal region really generalize across sequences in such a way is unclear. So this is the second question I wanna to address today whether hippocampal sequence memories generalize temporal relations across sequences. And to get at these questions, we ran an fMRI study consisting of four parts, and I will walk you through these as we go. And I'll start with the day learning task, which is at the heart of our paradigm. So in this task, participants had to infer when different events of a sequence took place relative to a hidden virtual clock. And the virtual time of each event was fixed, but um, the current virtual time was revealed at varying um, points, uh, once in between each pair of events. And these are what I call time cues. And so to construct the event times, participants had to combine their experience of passing time when the screen is black uh, with these infrequent time cues. And we asked participants to learn the virtual time of four sequences consisting of five events each. And so we want them to learn the virtual, or want them to learn the times relative to the hidden virtual clock. So to construct these times, but it could also be that they only pick up on the order of events in the sequence. So event position one, two, three, four, five, or it could be the real time in seconds that elapses between events that drives learning. And to partially disentangle these time metrics, 
we varied the speed of the hidden virtual clock between the four uh, between the four sequences that we asked participants to learn. To test participants' memory, uh, we admin uh, administered a so-called timeline task at the very end of the experiment. Uh, here we asked participants to drag the events of a sequence to a timeline. And here I'm showing you the raw data um, separated in four rows for the different um, uh, for the four different sequences. And at the bottom in the, along the gray line, you see the true times of events. And on top of that, in the rain cloud plots, you see the, you see the single participant responses. And what you can already see just by looking at the raw data is that uh, the response distributions are nicely centered on the uh, correct event times. And indeed, if we look at the errors that participants make in that uh, event time constructions, these are very low, um, below one virtual hour um, on average. So participants form very ac accurate memory for the event times. Now to test whether this is really uh, because they learned uh, event times relative to the hidden clock, we regressed the constructed times on the different time metrics uh, using a summary statistics approach as well as mixed models. And what we see is that virtual time explains the constructed event times even when competing for variance with order in real time. So participants' responses are really driven by their mental constructions of when these events take place um, relative to the hidden clock. And this effect goes beyond order and real time. So with that, let's turn to the imaging data. The main question here is whether event representations in the anterior hippocampus change to reflect the temporal structure of the different event sequences. And to test this, we scanned participants before and after learning. And in these scans, we showed the events in random order. Using representational similarity analysis, we quantify changes in event representations relative to a pre-learning uh, baseline scan. And we then test whether this representational change can be explained by temporal distances between events. And we can quantify these temporal distances, of course, uh, using um, the constructed virtual time, ordinal distances, or distances uh, based on real elapsing time. And we can run these analyses separately for events that belong to the same sequence or for pairs of events um, that, are across, uh, that are from different sequences to test the generalization effect. And so we bring representational change and the temporal distances together using model-based representational similarity analysis. And we employ a, a two approaches, one permutation-based summary statistics approach and using linear mixed models. And in this quick overview, I'll focus on the anterior hippocampus. So first, let's look at events that come from the same sequence. What we observe is that temporal distances measured by virtual time explain pattern similarity change in the anterior hippocampus. Temporal distances correlate positively with similarity. So somewhat surprisingly, uh, events that are far, in part, far apart in time get relatively more similar. Next, as for the behavioral data, we ran an analysis where we simultaneously use all three time metrics as predictors. And importantly, oops, not moving, okay. And importantly, um, the effect of constructed time is also significant when competing for variance with the other time metrics. So pattern similarity change in the anterior hippocampus reflects temporal relations based on uh, mnemonically constructed event times beyond order and real time. Now to look at the potential generalization of constructed event times across sequences, uh, we tested whether the similarity of event representations changed according to virtual time but now for events that belong to different sequences, so shown in red here. And indeed, what we observed were consistent negative correlations. So the blue bar here is what I've shown you before. These are the same sequence comparisons. And now if we look at the different sequence comparisons, we see, uh, we see consistent negative correlations. So for events from different sequences, events that are close together in time get more similar than events that are far apart. And there's, there's a significant interaction uh, between the way um, pattern similarity changes as a function of temporal distance for same and different sequence um, events. And to illustrate this a bit more, I can show you uh, simply the raw pattern similarity change values separately for same sequence event pairs shown in blue and different sequence event pairs shown in red. And what you can see is that for same sequence events, uh, similarity is higher when temporal distance is high rather than low. Uh, and the uh, reverse is true for, um, for different sequence events. So the way event representations in the anterior hippocampus reflect constructed times depends on whether events are from the same sequence or not. So to sum this up, 
um, our data show that participants form fine-grained memories of the virtual day structure. They successfully construct the event times from the time cues and their experience of passing time. And it's really this constructed time that drives their responses in the timeline task, not just the remembered order or actually elapsing time. In the hippocampus, we see that event representations change from before to after learning to resemble temporal relations. And importantly, it's the constructed event times that shape hippocampal sequence memories above and beyond the effects of order and real time. And intriguingly, temporal relations also shape representations of events that belong to different sequences. So knowledge about the temporal structure generalizes across sequences. And one important thing to note here is that the way temporal relations shape these hippocampal event representations depends on whether events are from the same sequence or not. And there's a lot more in this uh, data set that I couldn't present today, but if you're curious, uh, check out the preprint. So for example, we can show that there's an anatomical overlap uh, between the mnemonic construction and the generalization effect. Uh, if we compare our main regions of interest, the anterior hippocampus and the lateral entorhinal cortex, uh, there's a dissociation in the way they uh, encode temporal relations um, and uh, sequence membership. And lastly, we also show that uh, on the behavioral level, structural knowledge about the sequences biases the construction of specific event times, showing that uh, mnemonic constructions a mnemonic construction is not only facilitated, but also biased by general knowledge. So if you're curious, um, make sure to check out the preprint. And with that, I'd like to close and thank you all for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Jakob. That was so elegant and really exciting. I, I can't imagine when you were like, oh, there's more. I was like, that's, that's great. I can't re wait to, uh, I read the preprint when you sent it to me and I can't wait to read it again with some of the insight that you provided here of what you hit as your highlights. Um, so I would like to, again, invite uh, anyone who has a question to first just type it quickly in the chat box, or if you're Rosanna, you get special privileges, so you can just ask right away. Hi, very nice talk, beautiful study. I was just curious if there were, um, for the fast clock and the slow clock, were those times selected on sort of biologically informed um, processes that you think might be occurring at either a faster or a slower time scales? Um, actually, no. So um, we didn't have any uh, meaning, in, or so we fully randomized uh, the events. So the events um, are screenshots from the Sims. So they are sort of lifelike events, like reading the newspaper, running on a treadmill, and so on. And we've done a uh, pilot study in which we asked participants uh, to rate when they think these events are likely to take place during a day, and selected the ones where people thought it was most ambiguous because we wanted to randomize them, uh, randomize the assignment of days to sequences and positions across participants. So yeah, uh, but it would be interesting to like ac actually add meaning to this, right? And uh, yeah, take it a, a step further. Yeah, good question, thanks. All right, I think we have a time for one more quick question. We'll probably run just a little bit over, uh, but please hang out because we have a one last talk coming up. Um, so uh, from the chat, uh, Shane O'Mara, Perhaps you might comment on how your task maps to theories of mental time travel. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, in, in the data that I've shown you today, right, we're looking at the, uh, at the period where we show the event images in random order, right? Um, so um, one thing that could, um, could be going on here is that participants sort of, um, uh, when, when seeing or when being cued with one of the event images, uh, that they mentally um, reinstate that sequence of events. Um, but they might be doing this in a sort of um, schematic way, uh, giving rise to this uh, generalization effect that we, uh, that we also see. Um, but of course, uh, these are not, or I mean, these are lab stimuli, right? So they're um, they're fairly complex in that they are the, from this life simulation game, um, but still they're static images, right? So uh, it's not like um, participants are really engaging in mental time travel to uh, of of a previous autobiographical uh, memory, basically like reliving this uh, this experience. 
Awesome. Well, thank you again, Jakob. It was, again, very elegant and fantastic work. And Thanks. with that, I'm going to uh, flip back to Roban, who is going to introduce Pierre-Yves. If you'd like to start sharing your screen, uh, I will be quiet. Yes, yeah, so our last, last uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Pierre-Yves Jonas. Uh, so Dr. Jonah is an associate researcher in the MPEN research team in Rennes, France. Uh, he is also a clinical uh, neuropsychologist in the Rennes Memory Clinic, and his research interests include the cognitive and cerebral basis of declarative memory. Uh, he mainly uses methods from experimental psychology and neuropsychology, as well as structural and uh, functional imaging. And uh, today we'll be sharing his work, Superior expl uh, Explicit Memory Despite Severe Atrophy uh, of the Extended Hippocampal System, uh, case report. So, Pierre. Uh... Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Kelsey and Robin, for having me in this webinar. It's an honor. Well, to be honest, I'm a bit impressed, but also excited uh, to report on this fascinating case of developmental amnesia today. So I'm sure everyone has in mind this seminal science article from Farnay Varga Kadem when she first described the so-called syndrome of developmental amnesia. The main interpretation of this syndrome was that the declarative memory system in fact hosted two subsystems, namely episodic and semantic memory, fitting at the time with recent prediction from Endel Tulving. Such distinction was thought to, to be supported by a functional dissociation within the medial temporal lobe between the hippocampus on the one hand and the subhippocampus structures on the other hand. So 30 years later, several cases of developmental amnesia have been reported, but as I will argue, their interpretation remains uneasy. First, uh, semantic knowledge in developmental amnesia is typically assessed through some intelligent scale subtests only, which cannot be considered as a thorough assessment of semantic memory. And when more thorough assessment are performed, impaired scores are generally observed. And recent evidence even points towards an abnormal structure of semantic knowledge in developmental amnesia. Moreover, attempts to demonstrate normal semantic acquisition and retrieval has consistently resulted in impaired performance, or at least in slower learning paces. So in fact, it remains unclear whether patients with developmental amnesia can acquire and retrieve semantic knowledge as fast and as efficiently as healthy subjects. Moreover, and at least in some cases of developmental amnesia, like here in the three seminal cases, significant residual episodic learning abilities are observed and their potential role in supporting the low to normal le levels of semantic learning have certainly been overlooked so far. Surprisingly, very little is known regarding the hippocampal subfields um, <clears throat> it is indeed quite surprising since the main hypothesized uh, etiology of developmental amnesia is neonatal hypoxia ischemia, which would predict a greater susceptibility of the CA1 subfields. Actually, uh, to the best of my knowledge, only one study from Rosanna Olsen aimed at measuring the hippocampal subfields volumes in the patient HC, reporting a significant volume loss across all subfields. And similarly, we know that episodic memory does not rely upon the hippocampal formation alone, but instead upon, upon the, 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 the extended hippocampal system. But yet only recent studies have consistently highlighted extra hippocampal damage, especially within the encephalic structures, but also in some cases in the retrospinal cortex. As a result, memory profiles in these patients cannot be uniquely related to hippocampal damage following early hypoxia. So here I would like to report on our findings with the patient KA presenting with a rare profile of developmental amnesia. Patient KA is a right-hander male who was age 27 when we first met in 2009. He experienced severe neonatal hypoxia in the context of preterm of premature birth and presents with a typical anterograde amnesia profile with severe day-to-day -day memory loss. These pictures, for example, show you some of the reminders literally covering his flat walls, where he cannot live fully independently without the supervision of his parents. And when compared with other well-known patients with developmental amnesia, KA actually presents one of the largest discrepancy between his intelligence and memory cautions. 
Remarkably, a general radiologist uh, had initially considered his brain MRI as normal, whereas we found, as expected, a severe bilateral uh, hippocampal atrophy exceeding 55%. Moreover, the mammillary bodies here in the brain of Ka versus the normal brain here remained unidentifiable, just like the mammillothalamic tract and most of the phonics. And the similar was observed for, for the anterior uh, nuclei of the thalamus. A whole brain cortical thickness analysis revealed thinner anterior cingulate and retrosplenial cortices, while surprisingly, lateral and medial um, cortices of the left temporal pole proved thicker than controls in the vicinity of Bodman area 38. Thanks to the collaboration with the great Renaud Lajoie, we could estimate hippocampus subfields volumes in Ka and found severe volume loss across all subfields. And for the sake of comparison, we plotted here the subfield volumes of Ka together with those of patient HC using the same normalization method as in the paper from Rosanna Olsen. And this revealed, as you can see, strikingly similar levels of atrophy in both patients. We also replicated um, these findings using state-of-the-art methods of automatic segmentation, nam namely HIPS and uh, ASHES algorithm. And uh, albeit this is still a work in progress, we also found uh, a slight increase in uh, volume of the left perirhinal cortex here. As for our core behavioral findings, KA consistently performed at floor levels across tens of recall tasks. And here I want to emphasize that by contrast to most prior cases of developmental amnesia, we could hardly find evidence for any residual episodic learning abilities in the patient KA, in line with his exceptionally severe atrophy of the whole extended hippocampal system. However, not only he performed in the normal range regarding cementing knowledge retrieval, but he actually outperformed controls across many tasks involving various stimuli. We then asked whether he could retrieve semantic knowledge as fast as controls. And to this end, we adapted a speeded go-no-go -no -go experiment, highly constraining the way participants can recall semantic memories. So pictures were quickly flashed for 100 milliseconds and participants had a 600 milliseconds response time window to make their go or no go response, which was followed by an audio visual feedback. Such a short response time window made the task quite hard, even for young controls. And in the first categorization condition, human face uh, were used as targets, where lures were animal faces. In the top down face recognition conditions, uh, participants had to make a go response for a given famous face whose name was announced before the condition started. Here it was the former French president Nicolas Sarkozy. Lures were unknown faces uh, matched visually to the celebrity. And finally, in the bottom-up face recognition condition, targets were famous faces and foils were unknown faces. Note that in these last two conditions, well, these conditions heavily rely upon an efficient access to visual attributes of famous faces, but bottom-up face recognition condition further involve a very fast online access to that knowledge, since participants are not aware of whom famous face they will be shown. Regarding the results, as expected in the categorization condition, patient in KA performed light controls. He also successfully underwent the top-down phase recognition condition, but strikingly in the bottom-up phase recognition condition, he outperformed controls. And finally, importantly, a minimal reaction time analysis shows that he proved to be as fast as controls across all conditions, suggesting that he could activate and recall semantic memories as efficiently as controls do. So to conclude, I think that this uh, case report brings unprecedented evidence for supernormal semantic knowledge regarding both accuracy and speed with little if any evidence of residual episodic memory. And this, despite severe atrophy, not only of um, the uh, hippocampus, but of the whole extended hippocampal system. 
I also uh, think that our findings uh, of an agenesis of the encephalic structures uh, and the replication of the finding of severe volume loss across all hippocampal subfields cast doubt on the etiology of uh, this syndrome, at least in some uh, cases, actually two or three cases, to the best of my knowledge, where also an agenesis of uh, uh, the mammary bodies, for example, was reported. Because this might not be uh, rather uh, really um, compatible with the suspected etiology of uh, um, only uh, hypoxia, actually. We also believe that uh, this uh, case study may bring indirect evidence for within medial temporal lobe plasticity because this finding of a thicker uh, cortex in the vicinity of Broadman area 38 might well reflect. Uh, this is only speculation, but this might well reflect um, plasticity within the middle temporal lobe uh, following early uh, hippocampal damage uh, after early hypoxia. And here I also want to emphasize uh, on the importance of an accurate interpretation of MRI findings, uh, because literally for patients like KA, this changed everything regarding uh, 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 receiving appropriate care and case management. So really, uh, it's important uh, for us clinician and for this kind of patient that the hippocampal subfield group uh, bring novel methods to better interpret uh, MRI findings in patients like him. Finally, I would like to thank you and to thank all the, the people uh, who made this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pierre-Yves. That was wonderful, but also so striking. You know, whenever I see people share case studies, it's it's a reality check of the implications of the you know what happens when there are damage to these systems. Um, so thank you for coming and sharing this work with us. Um, I will open the chat box now if anyone has any questions for Pierre-Yves. Or if you're Rosanna, you can use your special privilege. I mean, I could probably talk to Pierre for an hour about this case because it's very interesting to me and highly related to my work. Um, but um, I wanted to <laughs> see if anybody else had questions first. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we also, you know, definitely saw that um, in our case HC that she had sort of, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was, um, you know, much more of a preservation of her MTL cortices, especially actually parahippocampal cortex, if, my, if memory serves. And um, she has a very deep collateral sulcus, which I believe your patient also has. And also that sort of um, uh, mal, mal rotated hippocampus. So that pattern is actually very similar. And so I would suspect that their etiology might be very similar. Thanks. Um, Shane Omara has, has commented or chatted, apologies if I missed it. Can you comment on the status of the pre and post com commissarial fornix in this patient? Oops, sorry, <clears throat> I couldn't read that. So can you repeat the question? Um, just asking if you had commented on the status of the pre and post uh, commissarial fornix in this patient. Oh no, sorry. Uh, all I can say regarding the, pho the phonics was that all what was uh, all what remained identifiable uh, was uh, some uh, um, remainings of the um, the most posterior part of the of the phonics. I always missed it. Uh, is it the, the the pillar of the columns? I just sorry, <laughs> I don't have it now, but. Uh, Nothing else from the phonics remains identifiable as far as uh, as uh, as I could say. And Rosanna chimed in and said it looked like most of it was missing to align with what you just said. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Um, okay. So I want to thank everyone again for joining us today and for hanging out. Um, because I, I talked a little too much at the beginning as I waited for everyone to trickle in. 
But I'm so grateful that we have such a great group who is engaging with these webinar series and that we had such wonderful speakers today. So thank you again to Tracy, Jakob, and Pierre E for sharing your fantastic work. I really am glad that we have that as a resource too. Um, this will be this was recorded. It's being recorded and it'll be on YouTube by by Friday. Um, so that if anyone you know wanted to make it and couldn't attend, or if you're like me and you want to go back when you're not stressed about making sure technology issues go on, you can watch it again. So thanks to everyone. And we hope we'll see you next month. We'll have Dr. Maureen Ritchie um, sharing some work on structural functional connectivity. And we're confirming the flash talk speakers in the meantime. So thanks everyone. See you then. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.